Hi guys, it's uh, Monday of week, is this week four, Kelly? Week four. Holy moly. Um, and we have a special guest today, Chad Everett, who is assistant principal at Horn Lake Middle School in Mississippi. And I had the great gift to spend two days at your middle school, part of two days. And I came away with so much thinking about leadership. I think you are just an incredible voice for leaders not only leaders in literacy, because you were a literacy coach and an English teacher, so you really understand our field, but also you understand what it means to treat kids um, first as the young people they're trying to become, the, you know, the strengths that they have, as well as to just manage the building and manage teachers. So thank you for being here. Chad is also the author of the famous blog post, there are no diverse books, which I'm going to link to our Padlet. And um, today we just want to talk to you first about, tell us about your school, tell us about the challenges of leading in the midst of this pandemic. So good morning. I'm so excited to be here. So my school is Horn Lake Middle School. Like you said, it's in North Mississippi. It's about 20 minutes outside of Memphis. So I always jokingly say like I can be from my front door of my school to downtown Memphis on Beale Street in 20 minutes. Um, we have around 1,100 students. I usually never say it, but it is a Title I middle school. Um, the thing I usually say in introductions about my school, what makes it fun, is that um, it's the building where I went to high school. Um, and so the middle school moved into that building. So it's also fun because there are two teachers there who actually taught me when I was in middle school. I supervised the English department in that building and one, my middle school, one of my middle school English teachers actually, um, I'm colleagues with her now, so it's always funny when I see uh, them and I just jokingly get to say, I bet you never thought that you'd have to work with me, <laughs> did you? Um, and they always say no. And so I'm the eighth grade assistant principal. So I work primarily with eighth grade students and teachers. So that's around 357 students. Um, we're primarily like I'm responsible for um, them, their grades, uh, like if they need administrative help and then the eighth grade discipline. That's a lot. So what's changed for you as we've gone to distance learning? I am. So I think the first thing is sitting down and just, I don't know if it's so much reimagining my role, but it made me think a lot differently about my role before quote unquote distance learning. Um, like I, right before I became an assistant principal, I always said like, I want to be an assistant principal that teaches. If I can't walk in a classroom, um, any classroom in our building and teach for an extended period of time, not just one day and get a lesson to go right, then I don't want to lead. And if I can't, if I don't still have that freedom, then I don't want to do it. And so now, I started off with thinking like, so what does that mean for me now? For, te for like my teachers and my kids to still be an instructional leader, like an instructional leader to them. Um, and then for students to still maintain that contact. Like you said, like you got to come to my building and I told you like my favorite time of day is the 20 minutes I have with students during cafeteria duty and during class changes, because that's that one moment where it just gets to be about me and the student. It's not mediated by a teacher coming into it and we can check in, hey, what's going on in life? And, we can joke and play around about the football game or like they love to talk about like who's dating who this week. Um, so they got taken away. And so it's not just, I think my students that are longing for that connection, but it's also like me because it's also sometimes that check in for what's going on at home um, and being able to provide that support and just talk to them about um, life. Instruction and like now, I think over this past week, I've started to think differently about my role because one of the things that I talked about a lot and I hear a lot of instructional leaders talk about is I want to be in classrooms more. I wish that I could get to see more teachers teach or I wish for me like that. I wish that I got to be, get to be with kids more, right? Cause that's the one thing that I miss the most. Um, it's just being in a classroom with kids. And so now this week I'm thinking about what does that look like for me though, to come alongside my teachers now to the same as we've asked teachers to, um, set up distance learning, like now for building leaders, assistant principals and principals, what would it look like for us, whatever subject area you taught, um, to step into the trenches alongside teachers and model, I hate to say that risk taking, but model what that looks like, or less for them to look at you, but just so you can say like, hey, I'm feeling what you're feeling on some level now. And then also for my students to see me in that light. It's always funny when I go back in, to teach in a classroom, like I always have to give the same introduction because now those students don't know me as an English teacher in that building. They just know me um, as Mr. Everett, their assistant principal. 
So what's funny is I was like, do y'all know what I did before I was an assistant principal? I was like, I was an English teacher. And like, what? Stop playing. You can't teach. Um, and then usually by the end of the lesson, they're like, hey, you should, you should like teach. You might be kind of good at it. Um, so now I'm excited for what that may look like for me um, as the principal to come alongside them and teach. And then I think about like the work uh, of coming alongside families and how that sort of shifted um, for me, whereas like there are families that may come to the school for access to resources sometimes. And what does it look like now for them not to have that access and for me to still check in and see what they need and then to provide um, those things. And then like in terms of just as an instructional leader, the equity of the education that we deliver to students, like well, I don't have any solutions to that, but that's something that every day um, it, like wears on me, like the difference between the student who has access to technology in their home and the difference, like just equity among devices or equity among um, access to internet. Like it's, there's, diff there's a difference between the student who's accessing the learning on this five-year-old cell phone and the student who's sitting there with the new MacBook or the student who has to come and pick up the packet. Now I'm fortunate to work in a district um, where like we're having those conversations and thinking through those things, but I'd be lying if I told you um, that it, like it's hard because I, I think we all know during this time at the end of the day there's no substitute for that student being able to be in front of that teacher like th the power of being able to confer with a reader um, face to face like there's no technology that can mediate that and then being able to immediately walk over to a shelf and put that book in a student's hands so like we can talk about the ways that we make it work by like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna ignore social distancing on my shelter in place order and go stick a book in a mailbox. But that's not the same because I, I don't think of my job in terms of the student who has access to all of those things. I constantly evaluate my success on the student who doesn't have access to those things. Like the work that I'm doing to remove the barriers or address those barriers to move that student closer to full access is how I, I, I think more about evaluating my success during this time. I mean, I talk can, you, can you excuse me can you say a little bit about that kind of work like because i teach uh a population that i know doesn't have access a lot of them do not have access and uh, as we record this this morning uh i looked at uh, our first uh assignment uh, i asked them to do a little two pages of writing about what's happening in their lives try to keep it really low pressure and in one class i looked at my turn-in rate it was uh, six out of 32 and my second class was 22 out of 35 and I know that uh, the kids that I'm missing it's not because they're resistant to doing what I'm asking them to do uh, I I don't know where they are I'm having trouble reaching them so what are you what are you guys doing to kind of try I, I know Chad that you're concerned about the equity gap increasing in a time of distance so what are you guys doing about that I'd love to say we have some great answer. Like right now, it simply looks like I think for a number of the teachers in my building and for me, it's just picking up the phone and calling. So mm -hmm. when you recognize, like if there's a student that I recognize, hey, you haven't stopped by my office to, even if I know they're in the hall, you haven't stopped by my office to say, hey, or usually you'd walk by and give me a fist bump or you'd say something in a cafeteria. Like I'd be reading that situation and intentionally moving toward that student. So I think in this time, like it's just simply like we picked up the phone and called. But I've heard that same thing from teachers in my building. Where like the one thing that, that I hate is that I'm not seeing as much engagement as that I'd like. And it's not for lack of want to, it's just for lack of access. Um, and I, I honestly think like that's one of the great faults of distance learning, right? Is that we, we can't truly overcome that gap because even if I give that student that device, there are gonna be students in my district that still don't have access or in my building that don't have access to internet. Like it's just not possible. AT&T or Comcast, wherever doesn't reach those areas or just the difference of the student who has someone at home, whether it be an older sibling or whoever that's able to support them. It's no, it's no replacement for that. Um, so right now, it's just, like I said, it's just simple as picking up that phone. Hey, are you okay? If there's anything you need. Um, one of the things I started trying to do last week was just call homes. And not just in terms of, hey, are you missing that assignment? But just, I want to check in. How are you doing? Like there were parents that when I called, they were almost, they sounded more excited to hear my voice than their student it had been all year long, just to hear someone else say like, hey, how are you doing? I'm just calling to check in to see, you know, what's going on, what's going on. Is there anything you need for me to do? And they may never ask me to do anything at all, but just hearing someone say that, um, that is there anything I can do for you? 
um, sort of, I think sometimes it eases that anxiety. So I don't know during this time, like, what do we do for those students? Um, where, we're, where we're seeing like it's eight out of 35 or whatever the numbers are. I think in addition to that, like thinking differently about what does engagement look like during this time? Like I see a number of teachers who usually wouldn't engage students as much on social media and online learning platforms. So thinking about, you know, if I'm in a room with students, like I'm constantly reading the room and checking in and making adjustments on the fly. But if I'm not teaching synchronously, I can't get that out this morning, but like if I'm not teaching where my students are there live in front of me, like Zoom is no replacement, especially as we think about like all the security issues around Zoom sessions, like for kids being in front of me and being able to make that on the adjustment uh, or that on the fly adjustment. Um, it's like, I don't know, is it the like? Is it the comment beneath it? Is it the student that submits their assignment? You know, is it the student who, maybe they watched the videos that I posted and they wanted to say something uh, in the comment section, but they didn't feel as comfortable, the same as they wouldn't in class, but if they were in front of me, I can sort of coax them and ease them into that and think about what that scaffold would look like. Um, and so I think for us, like being gentle with ourselves and just saying like, and especially with my teachers, um, one of the things that I feel like my district did a good job of when we rolled out distance learning was saying, um, our goal right now is not to try to recreate the classroom online for students or the classroom experience. And I, and I say this like to any building leaders or district leaders that are watching this, if you have teachers who are still trying to teach their block schedule or their daily schedule the same way they did when they were in the building, you're getting it wrong and you need to stop. Um, because I think it's easy to overlook, like for you saying that you're concerned about those students that um, aren't engaging and you know why they aren't engaging. What does it look like for building leaders to then say, hey, Mr. Gallagher, how are you doing this time? Like in navigating how much you want to engage with your students and caring for teachers. We spend a lot of time now talking about students and them and their mental health, but there's also uh, inequity like in terms of devices or access among my teachers, like one of the things that we recognize when we moved to distance learning is just, we didn't assign devices to students, but there were some instances where we had to provide devices for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easy to say like, oh yes, you know, Comcast has a 99 or 995 um, internet essentials bundle, but that's great. Where's that family gonna get, or where's that teacher gonna get the 995 from? Mm -hmm. I work in a place, uh, or area of the United States where a number of our students' families work at the casinos. Um, which are now closed down. So as I think about like, what does it look like for teachers and family members and relatives to try to navigate, um, to try to navigate that on top of, of distance learning? I just, I, I don't know where um, we go from here. I think the thing we can do most is just be honest with our teachers and with ourselves to say that none of us has this master. None of us has any idea what we're doing now. Um, we're all figuring it out in the midst of that. So I think the districts would just be honest with themselves and the parents would be better off. That's a good point. I live rural, as you know, and we a lot of kids would go to the libraries because libraries are a big tradition in New England. And I think we have five beautiful town libraries, but they're all closed. So my kids who depended on that for internet have nothing, they have no access because their families are not going to get it. And I just think that we've so overemphasized the put it all online piece when you know there are no packets, nothing's being distributed. And so how much are we shutting kids out and how much um, can we mediate between now and the start of the school year? I think the thing that distresses me the most is the stuff I hear about holding kids back a year or, you know, there's going to be some kind of placement test in the fall to decide if they can go on to the grade. I mean, I think this is a time in the world where we should think differently about that. And with it, like it, it makes me think like we're going to start from a place of deficit. We're going to assume coming in that there's a number of things that those students did not have. Right. And yeah. if I'm being honest, I don't think that's very different than the place we start when we're face to face with them. Like we don't necessarily always start the school year with who are you as a reader and a writer now and valuing that and how you take that into the work that you're doing. I think mm -hmm. the other thing that distance learning and what we're in right now reveals to us is not what we necessarily need to be recreating that's new, but it reveals like what we weren't doing before. If you didn't have a thriving, robust reading community where students had gotten to a place that okay. they knew how to self-select text and knew what they enjoyed, um, that's not going to happen now. And I don't, there's no digital platform that you can give a teacher or give a student that's going to be a substitute for that. If you did not have students 
um, at a place where you were riding alongside them and had them used to that and riding a fair amount of volume at this point in the school year, it's unrealistic to now put that on them. So I think more so, fig more so than figuring out what we need to do in this moment, what are the things we need to carry into when we return to school, right? Like, so if this is ever stripped away again, or just for the best of st students that in, in our care, like, what, so what did we learn about our students and their reading during this time? They didn't have access to text. Well, guess what? If they didn't have access to text or if they don't have access to text now, that means that they did not have access to text before. So that two months during the summer or however long during the school year, we have students who are completely dependent upon us to provide that. What does it look like for us to start to engage community resources to make that possible? Because like you said, in your area and here, the public library is closed. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that you said so much right there, though. If you don't already have practices and materials so kids can increase the volume of their reading and writing during the school year, what does that mean when they're all of a sudden the school year's disrupted? That's so powerful to think about. It's interesting because one of the questions we ask a lot in workshops is we ask teachers this question How many of you belong to a faculty in which this is before the pandemic? How many of you belong to a faculty in which your entire faculty has recently had a substantial conversation on whether your kids have enough interesting books to read? And that answer is almost always zero. Mm -hmm. So maybe one of the things that comes out of this is an examination of this is an equity issue and it's exacerbated when disaster hits. but. <laughs> it's still there when disaster does not hit, you know, and I've sat in a lot of faculty meetings where we talk about everything under the sun, other than whether our kids have enough access uh, to text. Right, it's, I don't think there's, and I think we would all agree, these aren't new issues. These are just issues that have now been put at a place where we can no longer ignore them. Just like I think there are voices who have been talking about and calling attention to these issues all along. It was just a matter of um, that we could ignore it, you know, um, one of the things that I talked about with someone last week um, is just even the way in which we see families now and the way we engage families. If a student's in my class, it might be possible for me to make it through an entire year and truly never meaningfully engage that family around that student's learning and have that conversation. But I can't pick up my phone now and call any student in my building directly. Um, I've got to engage their parent in a meaningful dialogue around their student's learning and try to figure out the best way to support them. So what would it look like, again, for us to take what we're learning about becoming partners with families, as opposed to we know education best, you stay in your place. Because it's interesting to see like that model operating in so many places, but then on the other side, I see now where we're like, we're sending the phonics worksheets or packets home and expecting individuals that have no training all of a sudden to be master instructors um, in phonics. And so just, um, the complexity of that relationship between school and family. And again, what we're seeing now and how that should shift our work as we go back. That's powerful. May it be so. So Chad, what are you reading right now? The Lost Education of Horse Tape by Vanessa Seidel Walker. So it sort of tracks the life of um, the fight for equity and education, particularly in the South, because it's told through the experiences or primarily through the voice of Horse Tate, who was a school teacher and principal um, in Georgia. So as often as I can, like I'm just an education reading junkie, like I'm always going to pick up the book um, just to be inspired. Um, again, like trying to find my place in this work and just walking in the footsteps of those who came before me. Yeah, I think you found your place in this work. It's just so inspiring to listen to a leader. When I was sitting in your office watching me with kids, when you went into that one classroom because they were bugging the teacher and you had her leave and you just talked to the whole class, all of those times I was thinking, I wish I could have worked for you as my leader. I worked for some great leaders in K-12 and I worked for some that, that never could get out of my way. They could never let me try things. It was always like micromanaging. I mean, there's so many different kinds, but what I was so inspired with you was that you saw the kids first and then you really saw and heard your teachers. When you would sit with them, you talked to them, like you understood them, you listened to them, respected them. But it starts from a place of like human first. Um, like right. and it, even in a PLC meeting or whatever, like our focus, so we're not centering around the curriculum that's in front of us. Um, like, I, like we've got to center around the student or for me as a leader as I'm stepping in, like 
the teacher first because um so like in every engagement you saw me have in my building like i try to as a leader intentionally remind myself like person first person first person first regardless of like a good portion of my day could be spent some days doing discipline um but still even in those moments not behavior first person first person first person first because and i think that moves into a place of questioning as opposed to drawing conclusions, um, which I think has made me a lot more successful in my work, like as a classroom teacher and as a leader. And if we started, or if that was the premise in all of our work, like person first, this person in front of me, because that's what's at the heart of like the reading conference. It's not the text itself, it's the reader, right? And it's the, um, it's the writer, it's not the writing that's at the center of that conference. So I think in all of our work, if we were really clear about what we were centering or who, let me say that who we're centering, um, in what we do so in my building like that's the place that i start from and some days it's easier than others like and there are days that i get that really 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 wrong um because i think it also makes me reflect on during this time of distance learning as a building leader if i were in a place where teachers were completely dependent upon a box curriculum what is it or scripted curriculum what does it look like now for them to be trying to deliver that to students um instead of thinking, instead of building capacity, building capacity in students, building capacity in teachers as a framework for leadership. Like I always say in interviews with teachers, I said, now don't get me wrong, we want to hire the best. I said, but my goal is to build the strongest. I said, my, I don't care if you work for me for five years, seven years, 10 years, because there have been a number of folks who've gone on to better things that were better for them and their families. And sometimes they've left and they've gone and made a lot more money than me. Um, what I've always said is my goal is to develop capacity. My goal would be for you to be able to leave this place and go work anywhere in the world and serve students and do a great job and become a leader um, yourself. So whether you want to lead in your individual classroom, whether you want to lead among your staff, whether you aspire to a quote unquote leadership position with a title behind it. Like if we start from that premise of I want, I want to build capacity, like I want you to be able to do whatever it is you want to do in life and center the individual it makes it a lot easier um, to do and of course like i'm in a middle school so there are a number of opportunities like when you center the individual it makes for a lot of good lives <laughs> that one of the themes though i'm hearing throughout this entire discussion is you know the person first and coming back to what you said a little while ago you know in the middle of this pandemic when i'm trying to connect with my kids and you're trying to connect with your kids, you know, the first question I wrote it down is, how are you? Are you okay? Uh, what do you need? And I just encourage teachers to kind of think about that as being the priority rather than trying to recreate a normal classroom in an abnormal time, that it's really about nursing kids through these horrible weeks uh, that are unfolding. Absolutely. Thank you, Chad. This has been so inspiring, so helpful. Thank really. you so much. Like it's been so much fun. Good to see I, you again, Chad. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. I hope to visit your school someday. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd love to have you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.